everyone. Hello. 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 Okay, great. Um, <laughs> just checking if we have enough. Yeah, thank you all for coming Friday evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to How to Get Ahead in Publishing, organized by Society of Young Publishers and powered by Book Machine. I'm just going to introduce our speakers to you. Um, but before that, just for some housekeeping, you can uh, put in all your questions in the chat or the anonymous Q&A, and we'll take a look at them at the end of the session. Uh, hope that's okay. Uh, let's get started. So first we have Natalie Jerome, who is a literary agent at uh, Evita's Creative. We have Molly Kerwan, who is a literary agent at, Bent a at the Bent Agency. Matt Kalsborn, Head of Sales at Duckworth Books. And Ellie Pilcher from the award-winning Avon Team, Marketing Manager. Uh, welcome, thank you so much for making it to the panel. I'm gonna quickly jump into our first question. Could you please give us a brief introduction of your career journey? Uh, Natalie, can we start with you, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I started off um, 20 years ago, I can't believe it, um, as an editorial assistant uh, at Ebrew Press. Uh, I was working in a bookshop um, at uh, the time that I actually got the job. It was off the back of a week's work experience um, that I was doing at uh, Ebrew. And uh, yeah, I guess I kind of just went from there. My breakout hit um, at Ebury, slightly precociously, I uh, was a ridiculously young age, uh, was commissioning George Best's, the footballer, the legendary footballer, George Best's autobiography. Um, and I commissioned that and edited that um, at Breakneck Speed. And um, it went on to sell half a million copies. So that was quite nice, <laughs> quite a good way to start off. Um, and I kind of went from there to be honest. Um, uh, so yeah, my next role was at um, Pan Macmillan. So I spent four years there, again, commissioning. Uh, and my breakout again, there was a book called Crack Towns, uh, which sold 100,000 copies, the 50 worst places to live in the UK. And I'm from one of them, which is how I ended up commissioning the book. And I'm right here, right back there now in Newport, um, Gwent in Wales. So, so that was that. And then, yeah, uh, moved on again um, to another commissioning role, um, this time at Hop Collins and spent 10 years at Hop Collins, five years um, pretty much basically publishing One Direction. Um, so lots and lots and lots of books, lots and lots of books. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's been a varied and interesting ride. Um, I then spent two years at Bonnier and then I think everyone's probably exhausted by now, me telling you all of this, um, and then moved across to literary agenting, um, just last year, um, off the back of that. So that's me. And I uh, had a slightly similar path to Natalie's actually, it sounds like, because I started um, in editorial at publishing houses too. My first job was as an editorial assistant at a um, well-known publisher of illustrated books in San Francisco, Chronicle Books. Um, and from there I went to Penguin. Um, I took a little detour and I worked uh, for one of the, what was then one of the big magazine publishers in America, Time Inc. Time Magazine, People Magazine, big things like that. I worked on their very early uh, social media strategy back when we called it new media because that's how old I am <laughs> uh, and then after that uh, I worked for a digital marketing agency which was really interesting in terms of learning the business side of really any business um, and then came back to books and I spent some time at the Children's Book Council in New York the Trade Association of Children's Book Publishers and then I took seven years off with my kids which is a long time and I was really ready to come back after seven years and a very old friend of mine who was an established literary agent in New York asked me if I would join her from London, which is by then where I was living. Uh, and I established the London office of the Bent Agency um, in 2012. And that's where I am now. Cool. Uh, I, mine is less glamorous than this. Um, I fell into publishing uh, after a failed career in public policy. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I came to London from Canada um, a few years ago and uh, uh, my first job was at the Greater London Authority 
And after about six months of working there while Boris Johnson was mayor, I said, nope, this isn't for me. Uh, so I was trying to think of what else I wanted to do with my life. And I remember uh, coming on a class trip in London and just feeling so inspired by the city. And at the time I was convinced I was gonna work in books. And so I thought, yeah, let's try that out. So I uh, got a job, a temporary job as a PA for uh, Peter Mayer, who used to be the CEO of Penguin, but in his sort of pseudo retirement decided he was going to own two different publishing houses, one in London, one in New York. And, uh, and we just hit it off. Um, so within the first few days, he said, uh, you know, we've got an opening uh, for a sales and marketing manager role. Um, and I was really surprised because, you know, I've heard stories of people getting to publishing through the really hard hard slog of unpaid internships and then assistant and executive and here was a, a manager role on a silver platter. So um, at the time I said, well, I wouldn't hire me because I've never worked in sales, marketing or publishing before. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best pick, Peter, but, um, but he, he just had a good feeling. And so I worked like a dog uh, and had to catch up considerably, but I benefited uh, from, from just a wonderful network of people and publishing who uh, were just so willing to show me the ropes. So as a result of that, I'm, I'm still at Duckworth actually, uh, five years on, but now I'm running the imprint. So I'm doing, uh, I mean, yes, my, my role is head of sales and I do focus on sales as well as marketing publicity, but I also do commissioning. Um, I'm managing our production process and uh, I've got a couple of people that I line manage. So yeah, I just, just do a bit of everything, really. And then I've also started freelancing because um, you can never, never have too much work in publishing. So, well, I have to definitely agree with Matt on that last point when I come to my CV, um, which is much shorter than the rest of you guys um, and far less glamorous as well. Um, I started in publishing when I was in my last year of uni. I got an internship at a literary agency, uh, unpaid. So lovely. Um, and then I did a short work experience placement at Transwell Publis Publicity, uh, which I paid for because um, I had to pay for my travel. Uh, and then I got my first job in publishing in uh, Atwood Tate Recruitment Company. And I was there for eight months and I loved it. And I learned everything about the industry, not just trade, but B2B and academic and education, and all the different areas. Uh, and that's where I realized I was never going to be an editor. Um, and in fact, marketing was where my heart lie. So uh, uh, after eight months there, I moved to Canelo, independent digital publisher. I was a marketing and publicity exec. Um, then I was promoted about nine months later to campaigns officer. Uh, and then 18 months ago, I uh, transferred to Avon as their marketing manager. And uh, this year, we're very, very proud to say that we won the uh, Nibby for best imprint. It's just casually sitting in the dining room table. Um, but yes, but alongside that journey, I have also become, I'm also a blogger, I'm also a novelist, a freelance journalist, a podcaster, and a public speaker, because as Matt says, you can never have enough jobs when you work in publishing. But yeah, that's my CV. I think that's a great one to note down, you know, create multiple streams of income in publishing. <laughs> Maybe that's the new way to go. But thank you all. I mean, uh, that exactly why you are all here. Such varied and amazing experiences and how you've jumped roles. Molly, you've come back after taking a break. And yeah, that's that's what we want to know about. So I'm going to I'm going to go to a second question. Matt, why don't we start with you first? Um, when did you realize it was time to take that leap from becoming a, like, I know you were offered the job, but you also recently branched into freelance. So when did you decide that that, that was like the next step? How did you know to move on from your current role? At that time. So, um, so I like my first role was working as the sales and marketing manager at Duckworth, and then when we had an editorial director leave, they then hired me to just run everything and have you know manage staff and. Um, so that was, I guess, my technically my second role, and uh, and then when uh, the owner Peter unfortunately passed away. The company was acquired. I moved over to the new company, uh, which I, which is when I took on additional responsibilities. Uh, so I've just I've been doing that for about a year, and then I was speaking with my manager because we were just discussing everything that you know is happening and and the the day to day. And I said, you know, I feel like 
I just want to, I just kind of want to work in different areas as well, just because I, I don't feel like I have enough time to do research and to like bring all of that, all of that knowledge to Duckworth, back to Duckworth, so that we can really like just do, be a bigger and better publishing house. Um, and so I decided to, with his blessing, that I was going to do a bit of freelance work. And so, um, and it's been, it, it really has been amazing because it's offered me the opportunity to get, basically to get paid to work with other people, to see how they do things, compare and contrast, um, how I can, you know, how I can take all of those best practices and then make our company stronger. So um, I think my manager definitely saw it for what it's worth and, and it has paid out in dividends, absolutely. And so now I work with um, different publishing houses like Red Circle Press, who um, they do Japanese translated fiction. I'm also working with Gibson Square Press and they do current affairs. And uh, I also work with the Damien Bard Literary Salon. So if you've ever heard one of their podcasts, I'm the one who coordinates all of that with the various publishers. And, uh, and then, you know, the sky's the limit. I also do like a little bit of antiquarian book selling on the side too, uh, less relevant for Duckworth. But, but it, it, when it came to that conversation with my boss, I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't know how he would take it. And, um, and I, I just, I guess I was just really lucky because he's um, Pete Duncan and he's just like, he's one of the nicest people I've ever met in publishing. Um, so I'm really fortunate to have a great relationship with my, my line manager. And I think that really facilitated everything that I'm doing today. Okay. Well, my experience was really different. So this was a very long time ago. This was in the mid nineties and my boss was tricky. I mean, if you go through your career with not having a tricky boss, then my hat is off to you. But I think most of us at some point do. And um, it was a small team and we spent a lot of time you know, with each other. There's no really avoiding people. And she was just a tricky person. I just thought, I, I don't want to work for her anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the company's changed a great deal since then, but at the time it was really small. And so I started reading Publishers Weekly, the American sort of analog to the bookseller. And I was keeping an eye out for jobs in New York. I'd recently visited New York and I fell in love with it and I wanted to move. So when um, an assistant editor role came up at uh, one of the divisions of Penguin Young Readers in New York, I flew myself out to New York because uh, what was another $500 in credit card debt at that point when I was living on an editorial assistant salary, or actually I think I was an assistant editor by then. And uh, I interviewed and I was offered the job. And it would involve moving cross country, 3000 miles. Nobody paid my moving expenses. Um, and I found myself in a very different, very, very corporate environment. And to give you an idea of how old I am, I arrived at Penguin the week that the editors got computers. And I am not even joking. The assistants had them already, but the editors did not. And many of them did not want one. Yeah. So it was a very, very different sort of place. And um, I, I knew it was time to move for a number of reasons. One, in a smaller publishing house, the, um, the list is never going it, to, it's not going to keep growing because you've got a finite number of sales and marketing and right staff and production staff and design staff. So they don't need more people acquiring, right? And that's true really of any house, but in a smaller house especially, there's a lot less flexibility. And so I knew that if I wanted to start my own list and start acquiring my own books, uh, I was gonna need to go someplace else. Um, I also was aware that in a small publisher, everything is very personality driven and the people at the top you know, are very, um, I think, dominant of the com company culture in a way that in a bigger company, that might not be the case. Um, so, and I wanted, I just, I wanted something different. Also, I wanted to be in New York. New York was where publishing was and New York was exciting. I had lived in California for many, many years after I'd come, I mean, grew up there and went back after university and I wanted a change. Um, and like London is, if you want to grow and learn in publishing, you, you often have to be in London because usually the only way to grow and make more money is often, you know, to move to a different publishing house. Um, it was a difficult decision. Uh, or rather a difficult discussion with my boss, um, but it was absolutely the right thing for me to do, even though I didn't love my job at Penguin and I didn't stay very long because what I learned was that I was so used to working in a small publisher where I had a hand in everything, even as an assistant editor, 
I read submissions, I dealt with authors, I processed contracts, I would sit and uncover meetings. And you know, not a reflection on my talent, it was just small. They just needed all hands on deck for everything. And when I got to a big, big corporate pu publisher like Penguin, I had a role and this was it. And I sat in my cube with the other assistant editors and we did our thing. And it, you know, if I walked past a cover meeting, I wasn't allowed to come in and, and, and listen. And I felt like I, I wasn't learning as much as I wanted to. But that's another story. That's how I got my second role. That actually kind of um, ties in really nicely with my point. Um, this comes with first a little anecdote, which is my claim to fame in life is that I once on an escalator told Sir Patrick Stewart I was a very impatient woman because he wouldn't get out of my way. Um, yeah, I didn't realize who he was until after I said it. And then I went bright red and ran the opposite direction and missed my train. Anyway, that's another story. But the, the fact of the matter is I am a very impatient woman. And with that, uh, I, I'm not a, a job hopper. But I have found for me, success in my job has come from changing jobs fairly quickly early on. Um, and it's only recently that I've kind of, for want of better words, stabilized in my position. Um, but yeah, but I got my first role in publishing recruitment as their administrator. So I wasn't a recruitment consultant. I was managing kind of entry level and processing the CVs and making sure everyone got to their meetings on time. And like I said, it gave me a massive uh, overview of the entire industry and was fantastic. And I loved the people. Of course, it was entry level minimum wage in London. I was commuting and living at home. And after eight months, the thing that I was there uh, feeling was that I don't want to be helping other people get into publishing right now. I want to be in publishing right now, um, which is a bit evil to say out loud, but that, that was how I was feeling. And so um, I went with my gut and I applied for a job. And I actually did something very strange, which was go to my boss who owned the company and told her I was applying for another job. And could I have her help? Because she was head of recruitment. I mean, who's better to help me than that? And she was great and she was lovely. And um, she helped me with my CV. She gave me interview tips. When I had got the second interview, she was like, you're doing great. You, you can do this. I'm really proud of you. Um, and then when I got the job, she sat me down and said, right, can I do anything to persuade you to stay? And I said, well, no love. You had your chance, two interviews back. Um, and then I, like I, said, I went to Canelo, but she was really supportive of me. And when I told everybody else at the company I did that, they said, why? You don't have to tell your boss you're leaving. I just, I was very naive, um, quite young. And I generally wanted, I, I love the people I worked with. I generally wanted their permission almost. But anyway, but when I moved to Canelo, I had a very similar experience to Molly with that smaller company, all hands on deck. There was five of us when we started. We were in the back room of this grotty old house, you know, in a conservatory with a roof leaked on our laptops. Um, it was, I loved it. Um, and like I said, five people. I was the youngest by far. I was three men that started it, and I was the only marketing professional there. And 18 months was, it gave me such a wide overview, and I was of everything. And I learned so much, not just about marketing, but sales and editorial and author care. And, um, but like I said, 18 months in, there was no more room for me to grow because I was the only marketing professional. I didn't have someone to mentor me. I knew that I wanted to develop my skills. I had never worked in a paperback campaign or an audiobook campaign. I always wanted to do like outdoor marketing. So the um, posters on the uh, subway, subway, the tube and uh, things like that. And so when an opportunity came up for a marketing manager position, I thought I had no hope in hell. I was 23 years old. And uh, anyway, I applied and it was blind publishing uh, or pro recruitment there you go um they had no idea of my age i had no idea who i was i was dolphin one two three to them until i arrived at the interview and uh, but yeah and i spoke to my bosses about it and i told them that i was considering leaving when i got the second interview and um but they did the whole can we persuade you to stay and i said it's not i'm not leaving you know it's not you it's me and uh, they completely understood that and i think job loyalty which is a, a term that's bandied about a lot within publishing um it doesn't just apply to the job you're currently in because technically they're paying you to work for them I think it also applies to the people that you've worked for in the past so I have a lot of job loyalty to them you know I'll support them forever they're great people if they do something you know if they want help they only have to ask um, so yeah but for me when it comes to changing jobs you don't necessarily need to tell your boss I'm just a very open person um, but it is good to kind of follow your gut be impatient if you want if you're impatient follow your gut and uh, it's not it's not bad to change jobs when even when you've got a good thing going if you think you can learn something from another position yeah i mean on that point uh you know i guess my career if you were to look at my cv on linkedin 
it does look as if it's a complete straight line as in oh she's had one hit after the other and you know everything's been jolly jolly but um i realize i uh forgot to mention the six months that i spent at uh, a company called robson books straight after ebri press and the reason I keep forgetting to mention the six months that I spent at Robson Books was because I just very impetuously applied for the job, not really thinking it all through. And the reason I did that was because everything was going absolutely swimmingly well at Ebre and um, like ridiculously swimmingly well. I had a brilliant supportive boss um, who I'm still in touch with, uh, who, you know, weekly would say in our um, tiny teeny editorial meetings um, and bear in mind we were working in non-fiction and on entertainment and trying to build an entertainment list um, at that time uh, you know what my ideas were for new books every single week and you know that became a part of my role even though you know I was 22 straight out of college pretty much straight out of the bookshop um, but, you know, was absolutely encouraged to bring up new business ideas. And so that was, you know, going really well. And one of the new business ideas that I had was George Best's autobiography. And, you know, I went through the whole thing as in, you know, um, found contact details, uh, you know, uh, negotiated the deal. You know, it was a, a significant amount of money. I was obviously handheld. Um, by my um, manager through the process, but he was amazing. Um, you know, sourced the writer, I mean, did it all. Um, edited the book at, you know, weekends and in the evenings because during the day I was doing invoices and photocopying and all the stuff that you would do as an editorial assistant while having this massive book, but not quite realizing that it was gonna be a massive book because I was still 23, maybe coming up to 24 and you know massively naive about the business about the industry you know just super young and you know got to the point where um the book was ready to go was ready to go off to print and i was two and a half maybe three years into being an editorial assistant and you know obviously you know all the responsibilities of that at the same time trying to commission and it wasn't just, you know, George Bess, I had other ideas that, you know, um, were bubbling and some of them were commissioned um, as well. And thinking, well, how is this going to work? How am I going to do this? Because, you know, I'm commissioning, but I'm also, you know, making cups of tea for people and doing the invoices. And I was coming in at, you know, the evenings and weekends because we didn't have, you know, laptops or anything like that. So, you know, I was regularly coming in, you know, uh, at the weekends to catch up on all the admin stuff that I needed to do. And also at the time, the um, team was starting to grow. Um, tiny team that we had looking at entertainment in nonfiction was starting to grow. So I wasn't just assisting, you know, one or two publishers, editors. Suddenly I was assisting four and commissioning. Um, and so I was thinking, ah, I don't know how it's gonna work. And also really, really mindful that um, I wasn't earning very much money. And money was a big thing <laughs> for me, particularly coming from South Wales. Um, you know, having moved up to London, uh, I didn't have, you know, much or any family pretty much uh, in London. And so, you know, all of my family is still in south wales and so you know it was very much this was my you know sole source of income there wasn't any supporting me or anything like that so you know the pressure was on and um coming up to you know as i say the end of editing george and getting all ready get the files ready to send off to print i started thinking i could really do with a pay rise <laughs> really do with a pay rise how do i raise this and, you know, feeling super nervous about it. And we should probably address the elephant in the room that I am a person of colour, as you can see, <laughs> which 20 years ago, especially being in publishing, was quite a challenge. Um, so, you know, not uh, necessarily having many people around that looked like me or were mentoring me or anything like that. It just meant the pressure was on. There was, you know, lots of things going on, you know, for me. Um, in terms of being able to push ahead. And so I just thought, you know what, 
there's this job I just saw at this teeny tiny independent publishing company. That's the way I'm going to get a pay rise. <laughs> I'm going to apply for that job. And I just applied for it, went for the interview, got the job, came back to work, told my manager, and who, you know, as I say, I'm still in touch with, like really fond of. And I don't think, I mean, he was great, but clearly I could see as I told him the news that I got this job and it was maybe three or four grand pay rise, which for me at the time was a lot. It meant a lot. And um, I just saw his face drop like crestfallen in a, don't do anything, just don't do anything. <laughs> and I always remember that he said, don't do anything. I'm just going to go and chat to someone. And clearly that was his manager. And bless his heart, you know, he ran around and, you know, got money signed off and whatnot and came back to me and said, okay, we're going to promote you to this job title, to editor, I think it was editor, on the salary that, you know, um, I negotiated in the other role. And I don't know what I was thinking. I just thought, you know what, I want to move on. And, you know, I'd been at Ebu four years and George hadn't quite, hadn't published. I'd literally just sent it off to print. And I was really impetuous, young. And I just thought, no, I've, done, I've been doing this now for four years. This is an editor role in a new company. Had no sense that, you know, it was an independent publisher. So it was going to be very different from Random House, you know, Random House, the biggest publisher in the world. And I just walked, you know, pretty much into, you know, a job as an editorial assistant. And so my sense of what the publishing industry was, was that. And so I just thought, no, I'm, I'm going to take this job. And I did. And it probably wasn't the best thing to do because I lasted six months. And I quite quickly realised, wow, there is a big difference in terms of, you know, working for a major corporate publishing house, how they do things. Also being able to fulfil my ambitions um on the commissioning front because as you can imagine having been schooled and taught you know from day one you know your ideas are valuable i value your ideas and your contributions that was it for me like fire was lit and so suddenly as an editor in a much smaller company with you know less budget and all sorts of things and you know the focus being on you're now editing the books which on, on the one hand was helpful because it just meant in terms of the skill set I was developing it was pure editorial so it was taking books that other people had acquired and editing them and getting the files ready to print so that was good but of course I'd had this fire lit <laughs> so I was like oh how what and at the same time um you know going into the autumn so I sent George off to print in the July I think it was and it published in the October and I remember speaking to his agents and explaining I was leaving whatever and he and again saying what are you doing but fine um but, you know getting things together like you know will George do certain appearances on certain tv shows like Parkinson whatever doing all of that sort of stuff and then going seeing the book come out in the October, the serialization in the um, Sun newspaper, and it was massive. I mean, it was massive. I mean, my grandma, God rest her soul, did tell me that, that he was the David Beckham of the day. So she did tip me off really, really well, God love her. But still, it went nuts. And at the time, I was then at this small independent publishing house going, what have I done? <laughs> what have I just done? And then obviously seeing the book, you know, Sunday Times, number three, you know, bestseller and so on. And I did think, uh, yeah. So in a way, as tricky an experience as it was, it really focused me in terms of, right, this is where your career, I felt, needed to go. And that, yes, of course, you know, salary is massively important. And I was in a position where, you know, supporting myself and you know there wasn't anyone to help me out so I really really needed to progress and quickly because the salary obviously as an editorial assistant assistant editor editor commissioning editor and so on it's not there aren't great leaps um, and it certainly wasn't then still is the case to a certain extent transparent in terms of what the salary bands would be and so um, I applied for a job as a commissioning editor at Box Tree at Pan Macmillan 
and got that job. And that was good <laughs> because, you know, it enabled me to then balance the commissioning. It was expected of me to commission. And I was back in a, you know, major trade publishing house and I felt more comfortable, let's say. So that's that. Yeah. yeah. What a journey. I mean, um, uh, sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, it's fine. Oh, right. No, okay. Fine. No, I was just going to say it is important to have an amazing line manager. If you don't, you, you can think of moving like Molly has. It is so important to have that conversation and they're really awkward conversations you guys have had. Uh, and uh, yeah, and like Ellie said, if you're impatient, if you know that fire is lit, like take that move. That's, mm -hmm. that's really good advice. If, if you know your passion by now, go for it take that move um i'm gonna uh, go to the next question so molly if we can start with you um how did you negotiate your salaries and uh, sorry i think you've already had that i'm so sorry ellie can we start with you please <laughs> molly's like yeah. wait that was, that was not me <laughs> uh could you tell us how you negotiate salaries and promotions um with your line manager or your next job role? Yeah, of course. Um, I feel like I should say that even though I did talk to my boss about leaving in for both those jobs I was previously in, I did actually get promoted in both jobs as well. So um, I did have that negotiation kind of conversation. Um, and I'll also say that it is the most awkward conversation you could possibly have. I don't think anyone ever enjoys that conversation. It's horrible for every party involved, um, but it needs to be done. And I think with time you get better at it. And I have a few tips and tricks for it now. Um, so it used to be like, I didn't talk about money. I was like, I don't care. You just pay me what you can afford. I don't want to be a nuisance. Um, but now whenever I go for a new job or I put myself up for a pay rise, I always choose a number in my head. And then my number one trick is actually to go to my dad, uh, but to go to anyone that values you and knows your work and uh, say, do you think I'm worth this much more? Because you just know that they'll add on a few couple grand because we all, as Brits, we all, and I imagine Americans as well, we all undervalue ourselves occasionally. Um, and so I always go in with my dad's figure, not mine. And I always think that if you're going up for a promotion or a, if you're changing jobs, at least, your job should always go up between three and five grand minimum you'll pay. That's kind of my, if it's anything below three grand, I don't think that's why I'm like, mm, I'm going to look elsewhere. Um, and then with regards to kind of the promotions and uh, that, like I said, I'm very impatient. I, I do like to climb my career ladder fairly quickly. And um, my tips for this is when you go in, if you're asking for a promotion or asking to be considered for one, always bring evidence and always read your evidence five minutes before you go into that meeting because it'll just give you that much needed confidence boost you need to say I'm worth this you know like that hair advert because you're worth it um, so that's something I always do and I also what I have been previously turned down for promotions as well and when that happens I have a bit of a conversation where it says okay you turn me down now please can I have feedback also can we set a date in three months or six months time where we revisit this and I can prove to you in that period of time that I am worth this promotion and if you go out for promotion again and they turn you down again at that point I'm like yep bye bye um, but yeah but those are my top tips and tricks when it comes to negotiating salary and promotions but you've got to ask for it you don't ask you don't get so yeah I, I totally agree with Ellie um, and I'm not British about these things. Uh, <laughs> this is one thing that coming into this this market, um, it, it's very the work culture here is very different. Uh, I maybe Molly can attest to this as well. I find it it's it's a lot more coy, um, and there's I mean, British subtext is famous um, globally, and I'd never really understood it until I started living it. So uh, I'm I'm just I'm compa by comparison a blunt hammer. Uh, so I just I just say like I would like more money now, um, and that's just how I do. But um, but I know that it is a really um, it's a really sensitive topic for a lot of people. And I think partly it comes back to this insecurity about our own value and what we think that we are contributing to a place and how other people perceive us. So I think a, a really big part of starting this conversation is like sitting down with yourself and saying like, no, I, I'm bringing these things to the table. I bring value. I, I think I'm worth something. 
And I think another company, if they were to see me and everything I was doing, would value every uh, like all of the contributions that I make. So if my employer can't see that, then there might be a bit of a mismatch here. I have very fortunately always had employers who are just like very happy with everything I've produced. And um, part of that is is work ethic. And you know, if they give me a goal, then I'm going to smash it well beyond what they expected because I just feel like I love a challenge and, and, and it's, it's all part of my like growing professionally and having, you know, just this next tick in the box. And, um, and I, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm bringing my best every time for myself and for my employer. So, but that, that also feeds back to my feeling confident in asking for a promotion or for more money because I, I know I'm constantly bringing my A game. And so if you've got all of that going for you, if you, it, it builds up your confidence and then you just say like, well, no, I, I have no qualms with asking for more. Um, but yeah, if, if, if things really aren't working out, like as Ellie said, things just don't seem to be moving forward. I too am really impatient. So, you know, I've, I got to the point with Duckworth where there's, there's the managing director and then there's me. So unless I somehow replace the owner in some way, um, there's, there's really nowhere else for me to go in terms of uh, promotion. And that was also part of the influence why I started um, deciding to do some freelance work because then I could kind of branch out and still stay really stimulated, but also like loyal to Duckworth, which is a place that, you know, f has, has offered me so many opportunities, has built me up completely in my career and I'm super appreciative. Plus I love my authors, you know, I've, I've been able to commission a great number of those authors and I think, I don't know, if I were to ever leave Duckworth, I think it would be just, it would be heartbreaking for me for the relationships that I've built with all the authors that I've brought in. So I, I just, I don't, I don't envy that, have, having to face that at some point in my career. I don't want it for myself. So I, I'm really glad with how things are at Duckworth and, and I'm just going to keep on, keep on with that and, uh, and, and, and be happy with where I am right now. But it could be that I get itchy feet and then decide it's not right for me, in which case that'll be another conversation. But you got to have them. Yeah, just picking up on what you're saying, Matt, about um, being super British and coy um, about money, I think I'm probably the most coy slash. Uh, I also wonder sometimes if I suffer from imposter syndrome mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, because again, you know, I look at, the, you know, the books that I've acquired and the money that I brought in and I have pretty much consistently, I think I've only ever gone for a promotion once in the 20 years that I've been, you know, in the industry and I've routinely applied for other jobs in order to get a pay rise. Like I have struggled with asking for money, more money, even after having a big hit with a book. Um, I've really, really struggled with it. And, you know, again, I don't know if that is, you know, because our culture, we just don't like necessarily talking about money, um, but also the lack of transparency within the industry about, you know, roles and what they should be paid. I mean, I was talking to a friend, I remember a couple of years ago, who works um, for a massive accountancy firm, and you know she couldn't believe you know how things worked in the publishing industry she was like what do you mean you don't know how much you're supposed to be earning for a particular job role title um you know this is going back to the days when you know it just wasn't advertised at all and internal roles even weren't advertised with um salary so it was very much, you know, oh, okay, there's an assistant editor job coming up or there's a commissioning editor job coming up, you know, you just go in kind of blindly, um, not even with a salary bracket sometimes. And so, yeah, I think I've, as I say, consistently found the way to progress my career was to apply for another role. <laughs> Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes, you know, it's difficult because as Matt, you say, you know, you build relationships with your authors, you don't necessarily want to leave them. But then at the same time, you know, you're kind of thinking, but I could do with a bit more money and I don't know how to raise this with, you know, your line manager. Um, and, you know, the advice I would give on that is, I mean, I do think generally transparency around um, 
roles and what they you know should be paid is absolutely key but also you know as you say Matt understanding and knowing your value and really feeling that and believing that when you go into those conversations but it's still super awkward you know um you know you have your appraisal process and so on and you can raise you know your expectations and your career progression in those meetings but you know they're usually annually and yeah it's just it's not a comfortable thing and i wish i do wish it was maybe made slightly easier for people i'm speaking you know not as an agent now but as you know someone who was a publishing exec for many many years i do wish that the conversation was just smooth you know just smoother um and less fraught i think the one thing that I would add to this discussion is um, just for a dose of realism, if you're applying for your second role in publishing or you're trying to be promoted into your second role in publishing, you don't have a lot of power, you know, and I think that a lot of big publishers are very happy to remind you that, you know, there were 400 applicants for their last editorial assistant job or, or whatever. And when I try to negotiate with Penguin many, many years ago for this second job of mine and they'd offered $25,000 a year. And I said, you know, can you make it 27? They said, no, no, because there's, you know, 400 more people applying for this job. And in those days, um, I think we just sort of sucked it up. Um, and it was, it was difficult because it's just, they just didn't pay a lot of money. And I think that's still true to a lot of publishing houses for at junior level roles. They're very, very, very slow to, um, to engage with junior employees about salary because ultimately they know that you're probably pretty replaceable, uh, which is not a great way to feel, I think, as an employee. And it is one of the things that I love most about my job now. Um, I run an agency. How much money do I make? I don't know. How much did I earn this year? How much, you know, what, what kind of commission did I bring in? It's all on me. So if I feel like, oh, it's kind of a lean year, I better step it up. Or if I've had a really good year and I think, you know what, I can ease off the gas for another month or two before I start looking for something else to sell, um, or I can you know, adjust my goals for my list accordingly. But that kind of self-control is priceless for me. Um, and it is something uh, that makes me realize how difficult it was for me to feel at the mercy of corporations for so long. Can I just absolutely echo everything that you just said? And it was great. <laughs> I know. So obviously, because I moved across last year, yeah. to agency and the transparency, you know, in relation to what I was saying about my friend at, um, you know, the big accountancy firm, because it's completely transparent. There's a percentage of the deal. That's it. So there's nothing, you, get? you know, to discuss. You know, you're not at the whim of, you know, the mood of a line manager who may have had an argument with their yeah. husband or wife the night before your appraisal. Do you know what I mean? It's just clear. And, you know, when I talk about, you know, in corporations and, you know, large publishing houses or just publishing generally about the process being smoother, that's what I mean. Just, you know, the salary band bracket, okay it's this you know that's this role that's what you should be earning you know the next job is this and that's what you should be i mean you know it's not rocket science but it's just you know for a long time anyway i know things are changing but for a very very long time that wasn't there and i can see people sending questions in even yeah. now to say you know what should i be asking for so it's still going on you know the guessing um, and as I say, you know, that absolutely massively contributes to not asking or feeling coy um, about discussing money, I think. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I, also, the fact that we don't discuss it with each other as employees from different bands and we feel coy about that. Whereas I read somewhere, and it was a clickbait article, but it, there's this country somewhere in Europe which just publishes all its salaries, like all companies, all salaries. So there's no awkwardness, there's no shame. Everybody just knows how much the other one is earning. Um, of course, I think things are getting slightly better with transparency, but we could do more. On the subject of imposter syndrome, something I was thinking of when Matt was speaking, like, you know, you should know that you're bringing your A game. Sometimes with imposter syndrome, even when you're giving your 100%, it feels like 
you don't deserve it you don't fit there and then with that mindset to like take it into the room with your manager and be like no I, I do need more money but I don't know if I um the one thing I do for my imposter syndrome is I write down every little success at work even if it's just sending 10 emails in a row like I did it and I did this and I did that and I created this gif that actually moved on time so <laughs> um yeah maybe that's useful okay on, on that point sorry Tano just to jump yeah, in um, I had an amazing piece of advice in terms of you know keeping a track of um uh, your successes which is social media which it's just yeah I mean we have social media we didn't have Molly I didn't we didn't have that you know when I started off so you know even now when I talk about some of the things that I've commissioned people go oh that was you because there was no way of logging it you know we didn't have LinkedIn we didn't have anything no, we, so didn't have using so much, we didn't have the bookseller archives we could search so, easily. yeah yeah yeah, so that's really quite important, I think, in terms of your footprint within the industry. Um, it's brilliant for that. Just to say that. I can't actually imagine looking for a job and searching about the company without a bookseller. So I don't yeah. know how you guys did it. One of the things I wanted to say about salary, very quickly. Yes, Publishers so don't want you talking about your salary with your colleagues. And the reason for that is I can think of a big five publisher here in the UK which has a salary range of 20,000 pounds for the same title, which means that someone, two people with the same title, one of them is making 20,000 pounds more than one of the others. I mean, you know, and probably more. That's the range for that title. You think they want them talking to each other about that? It's actually in some people's contracts, you're not allowed to discuss your salary in-house or out of house. And, that is and that's not enforceable. No, and it's to protect the publisher. It has absolutely yeah. nothing to do with, you know, high-minded ideals of confidentiality. So, wow. Anyway. Wow. I'll put them out there. But yeah. Okay. With that, we're going to move to our next question. Speaking about how you got into your next roles, did you... Uh, on purpose, consciously try to develop some skills to make that move, uh, whether, or what, did you find that was a huge knowledge gap that you actually did have to learn a lot for your next role? Um, Molly, should we start with you? I, I didn't actually, I wasn't using half the stuff that I'd learned in my previous role when I got to my second role, uh, because the role was so much narrower in, in a larger publisher, as I, as I described. What I did have to learn was adapting to a new company culture. Um, which was for me when I, when I was 24, 25 in my second role. And uh, the shock of going from, from a smaller publisher to a very large publisher was real. And so I had to develop, I mean, I guess they were just social skills. I had to learn when it was appropriate for someone in my role to speak up about something. I had to learn, it, it, also moving from California to New York, very different cultures. California is much more casual. Certainly it was in the 90s. And I had to learn, you know, when it was appropriate for me to, to be casual with someone or to be more formal. And who was it that still preferred to be called Mister in those days? Uh, yeah. Um, so that it, I, I think you can't underestimate that when you move to a new role in a new company, you are moving to a, a very different place. Even if it's you know a publisher of similar size, every company has its own culture, and it can take a little time to figure out how it works. Um, and you should be patient with yourself uh, as you try to puzzle that out because it, it can be a real shock. Yeah, I absolutely agree on that point because um, I guess <clears throat> speaking from me going to just working at Dockware to adding freelancing on top of that, every company that I work for has a different work culture. So I need to very quickly adapt to the way that they do things. So that is that requires like lots of flexibility um lots of diplomacy uh you don't really know you've never worked with the person before so you kind of have to gauge how much they know about the thing you're you've been hired to talk to them about in some cases their knowledge base is very little so you kind of have to like totally adjust the way that you would normally talk so you know if i'm speaking with my sales director at duckworth about anything related to what's going on in the market right now then it's all just very shorthand. Whereas if I'm speaking with somebody who doesn't have that salesperson in house, then everything has to be like really back to bare bones so that they can understand what I'm communicating so that it's useful to them. So for me, the biggest change has been um, having to be very adaptable 
and and to do quite a bit of research on the organization that I'm working with before I work with them so that I get a sense of what their base is before we start engaging so that I can help them appropriately. I mean, in the case of the Damien Barr Literary Salon, for instance, um, a lot of the people who work there are, I mean, there's obviously Damien, who is a you know, best-selling author, and so he's, he's embedded in some part of publishing. Um, and then we have like uh, Kirsty who's an agent and then uh, lots of like really great supporting people who are doing events and, um, and production and social media, but they didn't have anyone from publishing actually who had, who was like a publisher for instance. And so um, when I was coming in there, I was really intimidated by these people who have created this amazing brand that I absolutely love and have followed for years. And then when Damien approached me to start working with them, I was like, me? Uh, I was I was really, you know, I was quite humbled by the experience. And then I got in there and they were like, yeah, we don't have a publisher. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. So suddenly my expectations were like, I'm gonna be so overwhelmed by this experience. Going in, I was, got, I was like, oh, I'm the guy with all the answers. Um, so, so it's been it's been a really good experience because um, you know I, I I get to speak publisher to other publishers uh, because and that's that's you know sort of the basis of my role and um, so yeah it it just it I, I think I think w whichever job you're going into definitely like do your research and 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 kind of know what you're getting into but also be quite flexible and adaptable because it could be quite different than what you were actually expecting going into it and uh you know it's it one of the historical fiction authors that i um i'm friends with um imogen robertson she says uh you know you, it's you, to do a historical fiction novel to write one you have to do a lot of research but you also kind of have to know where to stop yourself because you then just have to do it and it's the doing it part, the actual like writing and getting involved in it part that then you realize how much research is actually necessary. So I would say like prep yourself, but then just jump in and, and you know, be quick on your feet, pay attention, listen to the people that you're working with. And then you're going to, most of the, most of the skills that you're going to gain um, are going to be from working in that act, that job actually doing it every day so you can prep as much as you like and stress out and freak yourself out as much as you want but actually at the end of the day it's you're, you're going to learn it from when you get into that role oh tani you're on mute oh sorry oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want yeah. me to chip in at this point? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah uh, well, I mean, I think I addressed, you know, um, some of this with regards yeah. to my move from Ebury to Robson and then from Robson to Pam Macmillan. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, all I would say um, in terms of, you know, just being focused um, on, you know, where your passion lies. Yeah. Uh, really understanding that within yourself. So, um, because, you know, ultimately, fundamentally, it's hopefully will be a long career in publishing. So, you know, it may not necessarily be a linear career, but certainly hopefully a long one. And I think it's so important for your heart to be, you know, really fully in the role. Um, so that's all I would say on that. Um, okay. I mean, I could talk about this all day, but I'm not going to. But um, I have a lot of opinions on knowledge sharing within the industry. Um, and I just think in terms of skill development, I've always, if I wanted to do something or learn something, I, I'm practically self-taught in everything, including my jobs, uh, because I never worked for market, another marketing professional until I got to my current role, and that was three roles in. So um, I have no qualms in asking people for help. I think if you want to learn something and you know someone that's doing it, ask them, tweet them, Instagram, email. And... Um, mentorships are really important societies are really important and this is why i run my workshops market your marketing workshops because i want people to feel comfortable with learning stuff and it's not a closed shop so um but yeah when it comes to skill development if you want to learn something it i promise you it's out there you just need to look it up and ask okay before we move on to audience questions i just have a quick question what is the one piece of advice you'd like to give for people who are in their first or second role today looking forward for that next leap and have no idea how to get on? Uh, Natalie, should we start with you? Yeah, uh, I would say to 
think of yourself almost like a little mini business um that as i say you know it's a long career um and you know your value and what you bring to different organizations and that there will be different publishers that you will be working for and that's an inevitability pretty much in terms of career progression the idea of being one publishing company from cradle to grave um i don't think it's gonna happen uh, so yeah i think um that certainly has helped me um, in terms of ideas generation and, you know, really believing in the ideas that I was raising, um, you know, any given organization. But if you know your worth and you know and think of yourself as a little mini business, then that uh, sensibility, you can apply that to whatever organization, wherever you're going. And also it just makes you feel feel valued and valuable and that's you know i can't stress that enough um in terms of you know long-term career progression yeah i think that's great advice um and building on what ellie has already said uh, very wisely which is to look for opportunities to learn and i mean all kinds of opportunities learn about people um ask them about themselves um, that's a great way to build networks if you suddenly realize you have something in common with someone that you that you didn't realize. Um, look for opportunities to learn around the office. Are you the one who knows how the printer works? Well, then everybody wants to know who you are. Um, look for the opportunities to learn to fill in the holes in your knowledge. One of the best things I ever did, I, I'm an English graduate, um, didn't, haven't done math since I was 17. Uh, and I realized as I was climbing up um, at uh, Time Inc., the magazine company, I didn't know anything about how to read a balance sheet. I didn't know anything about finance and accounting. So I took um, a night course at New York University, not for a degree, just, you know, continuing education for adults on accounting for non-financial managers. And I, honestly, it's the best thing I ever did because I use what I learned there all the time, both on behalf of my clients um and also you know because i run a business and now i have to know that stuff um so look look for opportunities to learn when one of my colleagues and i talk all the time about how every day should be a school day because when you're not learning anymore it just gets boring and one of the great things about publishing is that if if you do it right you have the potential to not be bored pretty much ever that's, that's, that's very right mm. um I think for me, uh, it, it kind of ties into both what Natalie and Molly just said, which is kind of um, be your own personal brand, shout about your successes. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be like your publishing successes. It can be anything. It could be, I've, I've read 100 books this year, or I've just finished this gorgeous painting. Have a look at it. Because I think it builds your confidence in yourself, which makes the conversations about salaries and promotions easier. It also raises your, your profile, um, which I think in this competitive industry, I mean, it's the same with any arts kind of industry. It is, you do need to stand out. And um, but I think that will also put you in good stead for when you're in a position to kind of say, look at how good I am at my job. You need to promote me. Um, so yes, think of yourself as a personal brand, as a business, learn skills and shout about it when you do. Yeah, I, t I totally echo everything that you guys have said. I, I absolutely agree about, you know, self-confidence and, and personal brand and always learning. And, and like my focus also has been really on like just learning to love myself and to be happy in my skin. Because what I have found is like, I've, I've struggled with generalized anxiety throughout many years. And when I eventually decided to tackle it, instead of just being like, no, 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 I'll just throw myself into work again and, and I'll take care of that later. When I actually made time by like going to see somebody for help and even starting medication, suddenly this huge weight was lifted off my shoulders and it made me realize that I was like, I can do like twice as many things now because I don't have myself in the way of myself. So, I mean, if, if you are struggling in any way in terms of like self-esteem or anxiety or anything along those lines, nip it in the butt. Just like, just get yourself help and you're gonna, it'll be the best thing that you've ever done in your life. And then everything else follows from that. Because if you are good, then everything about you is going to start to be so much better and everything is just so much easier. 
And so really quick, I mean, even just the, um, the fact that I'm doing freelance work, I was too worried about doing freelance work because I just didn't think that I could do it. And then when I threw myself into it after I had worked on myself so much, suddenly it was like offers everywhere. And I just, I was like, why didn't I do this so many years ago? I've really been holding myself back. So love yourself. Don't hold yourself back. That's my advice. Thank you so much, everyone. I realize that we are kind of at 7 p.m. when we were supposed to end this. So speakers, thank you so much for your time. If you wish to leave, we'll hang around for 10 minutes for any Q&A, but if you wish to leave, if you have to go, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm just going to go to the questions, see, uh, oh, lots of hellos. Hi. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming here. Um, Can I just, in while um, you're looking at the questions, Tony, can I just echo and add um, to Matt's point um, with regards um, inclusivity and diversity and loving yourself? So a big, big, big thing for me was understanding and learning quite early on. And it might have been related to the fact that I, I had a supportive manager, but the idea of difference being a strength so I'm very very conscious and very very aware that the conversations around inclusivity and diversity whether it's ethnicity or not can be fraught and for me personally in terms of my commissioning and the commissioning that I've done during the course of my career pretty much everything that I've bought um, I've bought in spite of the room if you would if you like not because of the room and it was because of my personal background and it is because you know i'm a woman i'm of color i just come at things with a slightly different viewpoint and that viewpoint is valuable because the world is full of different types of people who will want to read different types of books and that is a strength and so that would be a big piece of advice to anyone who's you know on this call who you know coming at things from a slightly different viewpoint and background and you know whether they're grappling or struggling or whatever with the pervasive monoculture that you know the publishing industry is still in the uk that would be my biggest piece of advice thank you so much i think we are at our first question um which laura has answered really correctly so lucy i think that's the right answer i'm not gonna ask that one um, would you accept a pay drop to move into a role that you desperately wanted or do you insist that they match your current pay even if it's perhaps more than the standard for that job? Would anybody like to take this? I guess, I mean, for me, it would be how, <clears throat> how, how passionate am I about the place I'm about to work for? I mean, if I, if the pay isn't drastically different, if it's a, you know, there's a difference between a 10 K, <clears throat> excuse me, a 10 K pay cut and a one or two K pay cut. You know, if, if it's, um, if I can see that there's potential for growth in that role that will lead to higher earnings later on, that's another factor to be considering. Um, if, if it's working with books that I'm just like, and, and authors that I think are, are going to be incredible for my career, then that's another consideration. So I don't, I don't think it's just about the money. It's, it's about, you know, is this the right choice for me in my career progression? And do I take a little step down in terms of salary now in order to potentially grow considerably later? Um, I, I would do that cost benefit analysis when I'm considering it. Okay. Um, and our next one is, how do you do deal with the uncertainty when making big career changes? That is this the right move for me, nagging voice in the back of your head? Uh, this is from Helena. I was just talking today with a client um, who told me that she'd woke up this morning and started re reading some Jungian analysis, which is not the way I start my day. Um, but it seemed to work for her. She's trying to make a big decision about her career. And she was trying to think less in terms, she said, of what was going to make her happy then in terms of will this opportunity enlarge me or will this situation diminish me? And I thought that was great because she's trying to make a, a, a big decision about uh, her next step with her next book and whether she should leave a situation or, and, and take the risk of going someplace else. And I think that's a really good 
way to look at um, uh, making changes that you're not sure about. What will this opportunity do for me? And what will not taking this opportunity do for me? And I love that idea because you can't say, oh, which one's gonna make me happier? I don't know how you quantify happiness. And I'm, frankly, I don't know that many people who walk around saying, I'm so happy all the time. I think requiring yourself to be happy is a lot of pressure. Uh, but if you can think about what will enlarge you rather than diminish you, that might be a useful way to make that decision. Okay, that's, that's brilliant advice. Um, I'm sorry, we, we're, we are running out of time. So I'm gonna take one more question, but uh, audience, if, if you'd like to tweet about them, we can get back to you later. Um, that would work as well. So, uh, okay, let's look at, I think one from the Q&A. How would you approach a promotion pay rise conversation when you're approaching the same amount of time in the role as your predecessor when they were promoted? Hmm. As in when, so as in like you're matching their career, do you mean? Yeah, you're matching the person who had your role before. I, I always think that's a slippery slope because I don't think you can ever match your career path to someone else's because it's scenarios are different. And, uh, you know, I mean, my career path is completely different to everybody else's I know in marketing managing um, at management at the minute. Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely a goal if you think to yourself, oh, they've been in this role for this long and that's when they got promoted. You don't know their background. You don't know their skills. Um, so it's that kind of conversation. So I never, I, I'm really big fear of comparison syndrome, particularly in the industry. I, I think, like I said, no one can compare their, their, everybody's career path is different. Everyone's way of getting in is different. Um, I just think you should base it not on someone else's, but entirely on your own. Do you think you deserve the promotion? Have you learned enough? Do you feel ready? That sort of thing. And rather than go down that, she did that and she said this kind of route or he did that, I should say. As and well. one thing we haven't really discussed too much actually is, I mean, and, and it makes sense because we're drawing on our careers and our experience is um, how this whole new landscape of coronavirus is impacting the trade. And, you know, we, we have fortunately never had to deal with a pandemic when our careers are going forward. Um, and I mean, now we're at a point where we're all having to make these considerations, but um, I, think, I think it changes the landscape because in speaking with other people, professionals across the trade, you know, there's salary freezes, there's people on furlough and some of them are not coming back from furlough. They're actually going to get laid off. Um, there, you know, as much as we had the 2008 recession where we saw entry level jobs turned into unpaid internships, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of doubling up of work. Um, even, and I feel like we already had been doing that for a decade. I feel like it's going to be even more so now. So I think there's no way that you can really compare another person's career trajectory at this point in time with how your career is going to go very likely there's going to be some stalling and it's going to be frustrating but it, it, keep in mind it, it's more to do with global events than it is to do with you necessarily personally and i think it's a really exceptional time that people have to be possibly a little more patient than they had to be in the past and also a little bit kinder to themselves knowing that they aren't necessarily the problem if why things are not moving forward for them. Yeah, I mean, on that point, Matt, just quickly, I know we need to wrap up, but um, I had a session with a um, person who I mentor this week and, you know, obviously it's tricky. You know, she's, you know, she wants her entry level job and she's looking and she's applying and it's just really, really tough. And one piece of advice I gave to her, which was to look at bookshops actually um, as a sort of, you know, interim um, measure while she's applying for entry level jobs, because, you know, a lot of the major corporate houses are, you know, freezes at the moment in terms of recruitment, like complete freezes, which is extraordinary. Um, and I certainly found when I was coming up to the end of um, my English degree, that uh, working at a bookshop and having that um, experience on my CV, and I was explaining this to um, the person that I mentor, was really helpful. It just meant that when I did come in and I got my editorial assistant's um, role, the sales guys loved me <laughs> because I'd worked in a bookshop. And, you know, when I was like going up saying, I've got this really good idea for a book and my manager thinks it's a good idea too, can I have some numbers? Uh, they actually took me quite seriously. 
So, you know, at the time I was a bit like, oh God, you know, I really want my job in publishing too, just like the person that I'm mentoring. And sometimes, as I say, the line, your trajectory in an industry is not always linear. It can do a little bit of that, but you know, you benefit in certain ways. So We, we actually just uh, hired our paid intern. We'll specify they are paid. Um, so we just hired our paid intern who previously was working at Kenilworth Books. So I totally echo what um, Natalie was saying that we really did see value in that he was working with books every day. And when he came in, we had him calling up bookshops and hand selling books. And to the point was he was even rivaling some of our salespeople uh, because he was, he just knew how to speak the lingo. So yeah, I absolutely agree that, you know, as relevant as it was for you when you were first starting off, Natalie, it's still very relevant to a publishing house today. So definitely yeah. recommend that too. I was a bookseller in high school and university, and I use what I learned then all the time. You know, the vocabulary of wholesaling and all sorts of things. It's invaluable experience. Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, that, that really wraps up on a good note. I, I remember reading Charmaine uh, Lovegrove also said that bookselling experience is key and essential. Also that we are in these unprecedented times. So if if it's not moving, if that next step is not coming soon enough, just yeah, just be patient with your environment and surroundings because that's uh, that's not under your control. Thank you so much, everybody. We're gonna wrap up now, and thank you all the speakers for staying past seven as well. Thank you mm -hmm. all. Uh, thank please tweet your questions if you have any. But other than that, we are ready to wrap up. Thank you so much. Goodbye, okay. everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.